Hello everyone, my name is Jackson Callahan. I'm a research programmer at the Sioux Lab at Scripps Research, and today I'm going to be giving a talk about one of our projects, BioThings Explorer. Before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge the incredible team I've had the opportunity to work with in bringing this project to maturity. BioThings Explorer has been a huge collaborative effort, and each one of us has claimed to its ongoing success. Let's begin with an introduction to the scope of this project. A lot of biomedical knowledge can largely be represented as relationships between things. For instance, it's known that imatinib treats chronic myelogenous leukemia, and we can see here that the mechanism it, by which it does is well understood. On the other hand, we have a series of known relationships that seem to imply that imatinib could be used to treat asthma. These relationships have been known since 2000, but it wasn't until more recently that researchers at the Harvard Medical School put this to the test in a randomized controlled trial. This is a case of finding a potential target for drug repositioning, which is one of the major potential use cases for BioThings Explorer. This information, as represented on the slide, is a knowledge graph, or as I'm going to call them a lot, a KG. A graph is a data structure that stores relationships, or edges, between concepts, or nodes. And a knowledge graph is just a graph that stores knowledge about real-world relationships and concepts. The main benefits of KGs are that they can store very dense heterogeneous information, and that the algorithms for traversing and operating on them are well understood and already established in many software libraries. While this imatinib example was found by human intuition connecting the dots rather than a KG, a computer could use KGs to find other cases like this very quickly, which would drive new studies. Obviously, we don't already have all the world's biomedical knowledge in an existing KG. There is, however, plenty of knowledge to work with in various structured formats from countless studies. So, how do we integrate it all? This leads us to the approach we took in BioThings Explorer. We'll get to the fun query engine part in a bit, but for now, how do we integrate a bunch of data into a usable knowledge graph? As opposed to the relatively more common data consolidation, we opted for data federation. You get a bunch of teams to agree to work with you and remain interoperable, and you provide a central method for accessing all of their APIs in one place. This central method is BioThings Explorer, or as I'm going to call it a lot, BTE. Now, federation in this way comes with some trade-offs. Upside, you can incorporate very large existing sources without having to handle the load they put on your system. Downside, it's harder to optimize for speed because your knowledge isn't always in memory. Upside, your sources are always up to date. Downside, you have to convince other teams to use your formats. Our solution to this problem is to just not require any specific API structure. Instead, we create a semantic annotation layer where teams can specify the already existing structure of their API using the OpenAPI standard. This annotation explains how to query the API, the semantic types of knowledge it provides, and the namespaces it uses to represent this information. To be able to target an API for a specific type of query, we need to know what kinds of relationships the API can give us. To do this, we map operations the API is capable of to the BioLink model. The BioLink model gives us semantic types for a large amount of biomedical concepts and relationships, and allows us to group different namespaces under the same semantic type. This annotation also gives us the ID namespace that the operation will be using. Now that we know the type of supported query, we can plug in our inputs to assemble it. Some relationship of interest with given IDs will target an annotated relationship. BT will use that, and an annotation provided template to construct a query to an appropriate API endpoint. The annotation also provides structural targets within the response to be parsed out and used by BTE. So, to recap, a semantic annotation provides three main things. Relationships that the API supports, 
map to the biolink model with specific ID namespaces, one or more templates that can be used to query these relationships on appropriate endpoints, and a list of targets to parse from the response. These annotations live in our Smart API registry, where they can be referenced by instances of BTE. This registry essentially represents a meta-knowledge graph, or a knowledge graph describing what kind of information is available in the actual knowledge graph of biomedical data. The benefit of this approach is that we can meet knowledge providers where they are. If they already have a TRAPI standard API, more on that later, then BT can already use them. If they already have an API, but don't want the added effort of writing an annotation, we can stand up a new annotation ourselves from their documentation with relative ease. If they have knowledge, but no API, we can help them make an API using the BioThings SDK, as covered in Dr. Chun Lei Wu's talk. Or, if they already have the knowledge and the API and want to handle federating themselves, the barrier to entry is lowered by only needing to write the annotation. We're also a part of the Translator Consortium, a consortium created by the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, or NCATS. This consortium has established the Translator Reasoner API standard, or TRAPI for short. This standard basically covers our need for a means of communicating knowledge graph queries and answers. Members of this consortium adhere to the TRAPI standard, essentially fitting the standardization approach to federation. As a result, BT can obtain information both from arbitrary, semantically annotated APIs and TRAPI-compatible APIs. Best of both worlds. Now, last time BT was presented at BOSC in 2020, we had federated 21 APIs, leading to 73 different queryable operations and 17 BioLink semantic types. Today, we have 51 APIs, giving us over 2,500 operations, and 41 covered semantic types. This visualization represents the top eight semantic types within the MetaKG, and the edges are representing the number of APIs that can serve each relationship. Finally, we have a way to access a bunch of knowledge. From here, we can talk about how BTE will use it. As I mentioned in the beginning, BioThings Explorer is a query engine for this federated knowledge graph. BT queries the Smart API registry to build a local version of the MetaKG, which it references when it receives a query. Let's take a look at an example. Step 1 in query execution, making the query. Let's take the following question. What drugs treat nephrotic syndrome? This question is represented as a graph, with one of the nodes having a semantic type, but no specific ID. We're going to call these small molecules in order to cast a slightly wider net. The next step is to plan BT's subqueries. First things first. Which APIs can provide knowledge about this type of relationship? Let's take a look at our MetaKG. We can see that nine APIs are able to answer this type of question. BT will translate our query disease ID to IDs that each API can work with, assemble the subqueries, execute them, and retranslate the answers so that we have workable IDs for each of them. From here, BT will assemble these edges into results. In this case, we obtained 460 results from five of the APIs that supported this kind of edge. Some results will contain edges from multiple APIs, as is the case for this result, prednisone. Prednisone is prescribed to most children diagnosed with nephrotic syndrome, so it makes sense that this one result is actually integrating knowledge from all five APIs using 15 different edges. This example may seem overly straightforward, but the real power in BT is that it can handle any acyclic query topology, chaining API calls for multiple hops and integrating the answers seamlessly. How about a multi-hop example? Let's assume nephrotic syndrome has another disease or phenotypic feature as a phenotype. What might cause this phenotype? This time, we have three nodes, two of which have no ID, and BT is going to have to find every phenotype of nephrotic syndrome, and then anything that can cause any of those, 
from whichever APIs it can, and then assemble some coherent answers. In this case, we received 184 results from four APIs. One result points to the NPSH1 gene, which causes familial nephrotic syndrome, a phenotype of nephrotic syndrome. I'd like you to note that the NPSH1 gene causes familial nephrotic syndrome when it mutates, causing a lower abundance of functional nephrine, which is crucial to kidney function. This particular result used multiple edges from the Monarch Initiative and Mondo ontologies. Now I'll do you one better. Enter Creative Mode. Creative Mode takes a simple one-hop query where we've said that we want it to return inferred relationships and expands that query out to multiple, more complex templates. This means we won't always obtain results that are clinically proven, but that's the point. You can use Creative Mode to find potential links, in this case, possibly for drug repositioning. Here we have an example of a Creative Mode result for that query. Dexamethasone increases the abundance of nephrine in the body. Too little nephrine causes familial nephrotic syndrome, which is a type of nephrotic syndrome. Dexamethasone is a corticosteroid, much like many drugs prescribed for nephrotic syndrome, so it's possible that dexamethasone might be a treatment for nephr nephrotic syndrome. This particular result is the combination of knowledge from two different sources, SEMEDDB and Mondo Ontology. Now, BT is rapidly approaching maturity. We maintain a live instance that you can run queries on, and if you follow the link or scan the QR code, you'll arrive at our homepage where you'll be guided through testing BT for yourself. That said, BT is also capable of running on your average consumer laptop quite comfortably. Better yet, if you've got a few requirements out of the way, it's as easy as these three commands. You can scan the QR code or follow the link for more detailed instructions. So, key takeaways. BT seamlessly integrates multiple sources to answer complex questions about biomedical relationships. Teams with knowledge to provide have a significantly lowered barrier to entry, having to only write a semantic annotation rather than making code changes. BT makes use of decentralized knowledge, putting the emphasis on interoperability rather than controlling information. And finally, computation can be distributed, meaning your workflow isn't bottlenecked by our server's availability. And that's the rundown of BioThings Explorer. Thank you.